Hi, my name is Dr. Brian Curtis, and I'm one of the paleontologists here at Fossil Crates. And today I have the unbelievable pleasure of speaking with Evelyn Volner. And we're just going to turn over to Evelyn to introduce herself and go from there. Hi, I'm Evelyn. I work at the Idaho Virtualization Lab. Um, we specialize in all kinds of things, as in 3D scanning, 3D printing, 3D modeling. Um, specifically, I do a lot of 3D modeling and 3D scanning myself. Um, I've been involved in a couple of different projects with them. Uh, I started there in 2017, and they're also part of the Idaho Museum of Natural History. So there's a lot of a lot of acronyms there, but yeah, that's basically what I've been working on for the past four years. I met Evelyn at the uh, Society of Vertebrate Paleontology's Albuquerque meetings, where she had a table with the Idaho Museum of Natural History and the Idaho Virtualization Lab showing off some amazing specimens. And I remember being blown away at the fidelity of the scans and the amazing quality of the prints. So, it, so you're a 3D paleontologist. You do 3D modeling. How did you get into that? Oh my gosh. Okay. So it's a, a long story, but basically in high school, I really loved natural history and I love museums. And so I had an opportunity through a early college program to have an internship at the Idaho Museum of Natural History. And they love any kind of volunteer work. So they were like, yeah, we'll take you. And so my summer coming out of my senior year, I did a lot of volunteer work with them where I worked in their herbarium, their, uh, the gift shop and then I worked in the prep lab um, in education and then they really liked me and I made a good impression so then when I went to school at the same university they offered me an internship so I started working in the education department and I really liked it and my goal was that I wanted to be a teacher but a little bit through school, I realized I don't have the patience to be a teacher. So I was like, I need, I need a little bit of change. And they gave me an opportunity to work at the Idaho Virtualization Lab. And I was like, that sounds amazing. That sounds like a whole lot of fun. Then I got this opportunity to work with the Idaho Virtualization Lab. And I had no experience with 3D software whatsoever, but they were like, that's fine. As long as you know how to use a computer, you'll be all right. And so it was, it was really a jump in the deep end and not know how to swim kind of experience. <laughs> <laughs> but I was kind of already pretty good at computers and I was naturally on that uh, spectrum. Then I started working on a couple of projects and they put me on uh, processing CT data and then they needed help with the Helicoprion project, which we can talk about in a little bit. And from there, I just kept getting more projects and then I loved it. So with the Idaho Virtualization Lab, I heard you say Helicoprion, and that is one of my all-time favorite beasties because for so long, we had no idea mm -hmm. what it looked like. So I'm going to put one an image up on the screen here of it. And if you can walk us through, what is this creature? What was it? And I believe you've got some academic research on this specimen even. Yeah, so this is a shark that is very, very popular in Idaho. Um, it preserves in our per Permian Phosphoria uh, mines. And so it comes out and basically no one knew what this animal looked like. And then in 2012, I believe, my boss, Jesse Pruitt, took a look at these fossils and said, I think I want to take a, I want to take a gander at these. And so he, <laughs> Her uh, museum director was like, all right, I mean, it's been a mystery for 100 years, like, have fun. And he was an undergrad at the time. And so he started looking at them and cataloging all of the sizes of each of the individual tooth whorls. And then finally, they looked at this fossil Idaho 4. And they said, okay, this one's the best one. So let's CT scan this guy. Uh, since they're usually cartilaginous fish, they don't preserve very well in the fossil record. So all you get is this tooth whorl. So they decided to CT scan this one to see if they could find any cartilage and guess what they did. So that is how they finally determined exactly where, where it sits in the, the mouth of this animal. And so that's a, a big mystery we finally got solved at our museum and no one knows about it. It's crazy. That is unbelievable because when I grew up, it was just this enigmatic 
tooth whorls and no one knew what they were for. I've seen them sideways. I've, I've seen them is maybe they were this row of permanent replacement teeth that mm-hmm. came out funny. So walk me through what your involvement was in the project or what you were able to, to do with the, and the, what the 3D technology was able to do. Yeah. So before I show you that, uh, you have to show the early uh, Alexander Karpinski reconstruction of Helicoprion because they originally found this guy in Russia. And so his little reconstruction of it has it coming out of the, the rostrum and it just... <laughs> <laughs> super funny and there, then people told them they're crazy it wouldn't look like that so then they did a bunch of other reconstructions 3d work that went into this they 3d scanned a ton of these fossils and we put them available on our sketchpad page for research if you want to go access those everyone can um, especially at 04 which is the one that they ct scanned and actually found the cartilage inside of the the rock and um, so my boss, Jesse Pruitt, went through that one and hand drew each of those segments, thousands of segments for one fossil. So coming in, I came into this project in the middle of things. So they had started a second research paper for Edestis, who's another really weird shark at the time. I think earlier, yeah. So they needed a little tooth for an Agazotis and that was the CT scan that I got to process. So I did that same process where I was drawing each individual layer. It took me, I think, five months of work. So anyone that doesn't think digital paleontology isn't time consuming, they're not looking right in the right spots. They see the output and it looks gorgeous and don't realize the human hours that just go into that, like cutting a fossil. We have our Faro scanner, which is this big old fancy uh, LIDAR scanner that you hold and you draw over top of each fossil and that thing gets heavy like you get big muscles from from working with that (laughs) it's it's digital preparation is effectively Mm -hmm. what it is because i know i've spent months preparing uh, diplodocid caudal vertebrae and that were articulated just a couple of them took forever and the matrix wasn't all that horrible so Mm -hmm the digital the digital side now once you're done though i will say when i was done i had a chunk of rock that was pretty cool but i couldn't do much with it i for instance i only had half of it prepared because it's so big and heavy but Mm -hmm. you get the you get the whole thing the whole Mm three-dimensional yeah so the way that it works is here i'll like hold a fossil here's my little ammonite so you have your scanner and you go over top of it and then you are done with the first scan you flip it over you do the next scan and then digitally you merge those together and then you have your model. And then there's other things like with Tiktaalik where we had scanned it with uh, Neil Shubin and Ted Dashler. And then for our last exhibit, they wanted a Tiktaalik, but they wanted Tiktaalik not broken up with all the crushed fossil. So then they gave that to me and I took those scans. And then I also did some digital modeling to create a full lifelike fossil. So you're able to take reasonably crushed material and uncrush it. To how much guesswork is involved in that versus how much is truly the, the principles of the bone and, and actual science? So most of it, most of it is based on the fossil. It's just moving it to, from the broken position to a lifelike position. But there are definitely parts that are um, fabrication especially the teeth, because it just, there's not enough of them on, on Tiktaalik, but I would say it's, it's 85% real. That's, all. That's totally something in the ballpark of digital paleontology. Um, yeah, it just, it's pretty easy to go off of something that already has fossil like that. Um, it's harder when you're completely doing a digital sculpt, but. So what's the largest specimen you've scanned? We did a blue whale and gray whale. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> I bow down. <laughs> wow. Sauropod, sauropod folks step off when, when rock walls get mentioned. We're like, all right, we're out. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so last, last summer, oh my gosh, no. The summer before COVID, uh, they went out and they scanned a bunch of the specimens that they have at Cal Academy. And those are part of our NSF grant that we're currently working on. I've been on the back end, so processing side. 
um, where we're making those available on MorphoSource. Yeah, so got to so go awesome. Wow, <laughs> that is fantastic. So yeah. what kind of advice would you give to someone that's, that's wanting to become a paleontologist, and especially young women? And I'm going to soliloquize for a moment. Your page is incredible. You are very inspirational, but your social media, I shouldn't say page, what, what catches my eye, especially is your TikToks. Your TikToks are delightful. They capture the essence of you and the, the innocence and wonder of paleontology mixed in with some, some just sweet sass. I, I'm not really sure how to describe it. It's well worth watching. But talk to me about both TikTok as well as, because uh, you're inspirational. When we posted yeah. your information, people are like, hey, thank you. This is incredible. So you, it, you're, you're definitely an individual that especially young women are looking up to saying, I want to be a paleontologist too. Oh, that makes me feel so, so good, but really scared. <laughs> um, I think a lot of it is learning to accept your imposter syndrome. And a lot of the time it's the voice inside of your head that dictates where you end up in life. And you have to really counteract the negative side and, Sometimes even if you don't believe it, you have to scream at yourself like, I'm amazing, I'm awesome, I can do this. <laughs> and I think, I think imposter syndrome can be a good thing. It can actually lead you into pushing yourself further. Um, especially when I started working at the museum, I was really scared and timid about a lot of things. I was scared that I was gonna make people upset or that I wouldn't be successful in the field, but I, you know, just pushing through it for it. Were you one of the first people on TikTok? Were you an early adopter? How, how did you, what is your experience with TikTok? Yeah, so I think I am a pretty early adopter, uh, but I also, so TikTok used to be Musical.ly, which was something that's been around since like 2014-ish, but it wasn't very popular for a really long time, and then they rebranded it to TikTok, and so like 2019 it started getting pretty popular with the gen z kids as a dancing app <laughs> and so then the quarantine hit and everyone was really bored and they were like well i guess i'm gonna go to this app and so right as quarantine started i was like well i think this might be a good platform to start doing like educational content so i started doing dinosaur videos each day and now i've amassed 60,000 followers which is <laughs> crazy that people people have cared enough <laughs> so <laughs> i'm like oh my gosh if, if i feel the responsibility every time i post a video um i will research every line i say just to make sure i'm not saying something wrong research is is definitely the main main component it's like i because i do the same thing when i make a tiktok because i'll be like here's something that i know that i don't think everyone else might know and so then i'll go through and see if I can find the sources to make sure that I'm correct in this and then <laughs> but yeah I'm, I'm so scared of sharing this information that's like a big thing that I hate so I never want to be part of that you're not only a 3d paleontologist but you're a science communicator at this point with a platform like that you're an educator yeah I've I've followed science communicators since I was in high school myself so it feels pretty cool to have a following in my own of my own like I feel real real responsibility there and I personally love TikTok so much just because the flexibility of the platform and the I like being able to have that type of audience too because they're my age and I relate to them. As a 3D scanner you must have the capabilities of doing your own 3D prints so do you have some really cool 3D prints that you'd like to talk about or share, or do you just keep that on the DL? I have a bunch. Um, okay, so here is a saltwater crocodile that was part of the NSF grant that I was telling you about. We 3D scanned that guy. Oh, wow. Check that out. And this one is the Gorgonopsid rubigia. Oh, look at those sabers. It's a crazy cool creature. Wow, that is incredible. And no, you know, antiorbital fenestra, you, us dinosaur guys looking at that like, well, it just must be fake. <laughs> yeah, no. Wow, look at that was jaw. Okay. Wow. 
Welcome to Evelyn Show and Tell. <laughs> wow. This is a 3D sculpt by my boss, Jesse Pruitt. This is Sarcosuchus. Wow. Unbelievable. I, so cool. this guy. <laughs> I see why. <laughs> and then this is a Edestis jaw, which is the scissor tooth shark. Which is part of the Helicoprion project that we were working on. So here's a Helicoprion. Okay, so let's so let's check out this beast. So, so we have adult teeth will grow in the back of its mouth and slowly but surely grow into a spiral. So the center of its jaw is its baby teeth. So it keeps all of its teeth throughout its life. Wow. And they got up to 35 feet, so they were big animals. Holy cow, what were they eating? <laughs> ammonites. So right. that's what my little block here is. Some ammonites that were found in the Permian of Idaho. So great little helicoprion snack. Wow. That's yeah. gorgeous. So they well, don't find any anywhere on these teeth, so that's why they surmise that it was eating squishy material like ammonites. Do they have teeth on top of its mouth too? Or what were they occluding against? So it's the top of, uh, like, there's a lot of really tough cartilage up there. Okay. So they wouldn't be slamming too hard in the top of their, their brain there. <laughs> gotcha. That's fantastic. So anyone watching and want, looking for a project, um, this animal still needs some more love figured out. And it's more specimens to go look for. And you get to be in Idaho, which is a gorgeous state. So mm -hmm. bonus all around. Mm-hmm. Well, Evelyn, thank you so much for all of your time. It's just been a wonderful conversation. We look forward to speaking with you again very soon. Yeah, thank you so much. And to follow Evan at Evelyn at the social media links on the screen here, we'll also add him in a perma comment so you can track her down and be sure to follow her TikTok. It is amazing. Thank you.